This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm glad to uh, welcome back uh, my, my old friend and former boss, uh, Congressman Dr. Ron Paul. Ron, how are you doing? Doing well, Jeff. Good to be with you. Well, this week we're talking about money. I know money has always been an animating issue for you. It's one of the reasons you first got involved in politics. And, and I would argue that second only to maybe war and peace, it's the most important libertarian issue. Did, did you ever imagine that you would have all those exchanges with Greenspan and Bernanke and that, and that the <laughs> Fed would become a populist issue? No, I, I never thought about that. I always thought that uh, I would speak out in some campaign, but never have to go to Washington. But it turned out differently. And then when I went, I thought, well, the, the money issue is going to be a big issue. And I want to speak out and set a record for what I think should be done. So it uh, it was always much bigger than I anticipated. If I had made plans, it probably wouldn't have worked out as well. But we had a gold commission that came up. But the one thing for sure is I never set my goal as to become the chairman of the banking and the financial services committee so that I could play an important role. I looked at it quite differently. I thought the money issue was big. And it is a... Uh, an issue dealing with peace because I see that uh, the, fi the financial system is so important in financing, you know, the warfare state uh, as well. So I was, uh, my goal was just to uh, speak out, emphasize the uh, issue of monetary uh, policy, and uh, it, it got got a lot further along and to the point where we had those presidential campaigns and uh, I was getting spontaneous support from audiences from uh, campuses that I thought were very, very liberal yeah. and they were already thinking about the Fed. But I give the Mises Institute and other groups like that the credit for introducing these ideas to a lot of young people. And I was sort of on the receiving end of some of the work that uh, uh, others have done. Well, you know, you've always talked about war finance. Uh, if, if you, you know, if you recall, we'll go back to the early 2000s, you were taking a lot of heat amongst conservatives for opposing this run up to the Iraq war. Now we look back on it before we got into Afghanistan and Iraq, we had about $6 trillion worth of debt. Now we have $18 trillion in debt. And, and if Bush had had to finance that war by raising everybody's taxes, it would never have happened. That's absolutely the case. But it wasn't not it wasn't anything new because uh, most wars are fought on inflated money. Uh, they uh, either dilute the gold in the old days, or yeah. they clip the coins, or they steal the gold. But they always end up with uh, inflation, with war, and uh, that is the case. But uh, today, it isn't printing money; it's just com using a computer. And we have license to steal because we issue the reserve currency of the world, and most of the country still accept our dollars, even though we're currently witnessing in these last few days a pretty steady attack on the dollar, which I think is mm. is going continuing and of course uh, get much worse but financing war through inflation is, is traditional and you're absolutely right if uh, the people had to pay for the war as, as we went along this would uh, it, it, it wouldn't happen uh, that uh, wars you, you you don't get enough taxes and you don't get enough borrowing uh, to to fight these wars and certainly in my lifetime the World War II, I remember that very well about saving nickels and dimes and buying bonds and pretending that we were financing the war and yet that they were printing most of the money for the war. So this is this has been around for a long time. But money issues uh, is a freedom issue because if you don't like the welfare state, you have to understand about money. If you don't like the warfare state, you have to understand that about money. If you in if you care about individual personal liberty. You would have to be a supporter of a commodity uh, currency. Uh, of course, uh, history shows that gold has always been, along with silver, the most preferable type of money. Well, the shocking thing, of course, is that that's what the Constitution calls for, uh, to, to be used for debts by the states. Uh, you know, one of the ideas you always promoted as a member of Congress was this idea of competing currencies. And you had some legislation to that effect, which has been uh, forwarded now by some, some various people in Congress since you left. 
you know, I'm not sure people understand the, the, the terrible tax treatment of any kind of tra- transaction in gold and silver. It's, it's treated as though you sold a stock and you have capital gain <laughs> yeah. or loss. And, and in fact, it's treated worse than that because the IRS uh, treats gold as a collectible rather than an ordinary investment like a stock. And so they actually charge a 28% capital gains tax rate instead of the, the ordinary 15 or 20%. So your your effort was to, to get rid of this, this taxability of these transactions transactions and let people use gold and silver or other metals as money. Yeah, if we wanted the Constitution to work and allow gold and silver to be money, uh, that shouldn't have that shouldn't be the case. But the, but taxing money, gold and silver is like saying, well, OK, I have a hundred thousand dollars CD. I'll put it in the bank and I keep it for a year. And during that year, I have to report to the IRS that the value of the dollar or whatever currency it was in went up and they say, well, it's worth one hundred and ten thousand dollars now, not not for interest, but just the value of the, you know, in real terms. They would tax you on that. Anyway, with it. people would think that's crazy. Right. But that's that's what they do. And my effort was to get uh, competing currencies, uh, legalized competition, legalize the Constitution, realizing that turning the switch off of a system that is rotten to the core you know, is not all that easy. It's sort of like turning off government medicine and all of a sudden substituting it, and they're finding out that's a problem too. But turning off the Federal Reserve system and the dollar standard is, in spite of the value long term, uh, you, you just can't walk up to the Federal Reserve and say, well, here are the keys, we're locking it, just get out of the way, everything will take care of itself. It does invite some problem. So I thought the transition should be just legalizing choices, legalizing competition. And that's why I was uh, always promoting laws that would repeal legal tender laws. And uh, that would allow people to uh, use other things. But the issue of taxation is very important. And some of the states now are speaking out. And I love this because they're, it's sort of state sovereignty, uh, living up to the Constitution, sort of nullifying federal law. And uh, just recently, Recently, I was in, involved a little bit in the uh, changing of the taxation in Arizona and taking and get rid of the capital gains tax. But there shouldn't be ever a sales tax or a capital gains tax on money, on coinage and uh, the precious metals. Uh, but uh, the the uh, big government people who can't stand this, of course, they don't want anything to interfere with this uh, whole idea that we, our special friends at the Fed, will make sure there's enough money to cover the debt. And that's continuous, you know, because we run up these huge debts, uh, 18 approaching, actually, actually approaching $20 trillion that uh, if, if we can't borrow the money, uh, and uh, the p- people uh, just won't buy our debt, then what do they do? They they resort to the Federal Reserve buying the debt, and where do they get the money? Out of the thin air. So uh, this is this is the way the system works, but uh, on, on the money issue, you need competition. I don't think that's going to work. I don't think people are going to accept this idea and all of a sudden legalize competition as much as this thing is going to come down. It's amazing to me how many things in the ordinary media today are talking about the foolishness of central banking. They talk about central banking, how bad it is. It's not just a few of us that uh, have studied Austrian economics. And there's a lot of people just out there in the financial community thinking, how can you listen to these guys at the Federal Reserve and the Central Bank for all the harm they've cons- they've, uh, they've caused? And, uh, you know, Greenspan is no hero. They say, well, he was started all the problem. He kept interest rates too low, too long. And so what happened when he left? <laughs> they made him even lower. They took him to zero. And the real interest rates taking him below zero. And they wonder why uh, things are confusing. <laughs> well, the, the legislation you mentioned in Arizona, it's basically the state of Arizona saying we're not going to apply capital gains uh, taxes at the state level to transactions with, with gold or silver. Uh, were you pleased that they that the sponsor of that bill invited you to come out and that now the governor signed it? And I wonder if you think the power if these kind of small measures at the state level make the powers that be nervous. Well, hopefully, hopefully we do. But I know uh, I see things, you know, from the educational viewpoint, believing that uh, N- not being naive and going to Washington and thinking, oh, you know, I believe in a gold standard and I'm going to be chairman of the bank committee and we're going to have a gold standard. Uh, mm-hmm. It wasn't that. And But this all has importance. So what we did in Arizona and what the Arizonians did is very significant because it, 
he got some news. We're talking about it right now. Other states are doing it. There's another state, uh, I think it might be Wyoming, that wants me to come up and, you know, promote, uh, uh, promote the same thing. Because it does get their attention that, uh, see, that bill had been passed before. For, but the governor never signed it. So uh, uh, it's just the pressure, public pressure. So that's the way I think education works. It's a prevailing attitude that counts. So I work on the assumption this system is going to collapse. This monetary system won't work. But what is the prevailing attitude of the people? Uh, they have to say, well, maybe paper money is the problem. And uh, although we all recognize, I think, that uh, ideas have consequences and you only need about eight or 10 percent of the people promoting the right ideas to influence the rest. But eventually you have to have, uh, you know, a consensus. The people have to say, you know, uh, we endorse what they say and come around to saying, well, yes, paper money is bad and we ought to listen to what the founders told us and the lessons they learned with the continental dollar. So uh, I think uh, what the states are doing is not automatically in six months, you know, going to see the total revolution accomplished. But those are seeds that are being planted. And I think it does two things, the monetary issue as well as the power and the strength of the states and emphasizing this whole idea that when the uh, federal government oversteps, the states have an obligation to step in and do something about it. Well, I would also mention in terms of what states are doing, uh, Texas now has a bullion depository, which it, to me is just a sign that states are starting to recognize that there could be a problem with the dollar and that they might want to uh, to move towards a, a different kind of system of, of real money. Now, we're, we're about out of time, Ron, but you, know, you had some exchanges, some back and forth over the years with Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan. And of course, Greenspan wrote that famous article, Golden Economic Freedom, which he signed for you. And I've noticed since he's now out of office, he's been speaking more favorably about gold. You know, what do you think of, of Alan Greenspan in, in hindsight? And, and you know him a little bit. Yeah, and he's interesting. I've had conversations with him about his relationship with Murray Rothbard because they were both Randians at yeah. one time. And he just usually would just uh, chuckle a little bit. But I uh, recall very vividly when I had a, uh, a short meeting with him and I knew about it. So and it was a one on one. And I took that original copy of Rand's book and the Objectivist newsletter and I took it in and, and I showed that to him. I said, you remember this? He said, yeah, I sure do. I remember that. And, uh, I, I, and uh, he says, I, uh, I said, would you sign this copy for me? And so he said, sure, he signed. And I said, do you want do you want to put a disclaimer on it? He said, no, I don't want to put any disclaimer on, on it. He said, I just read this the other night and I still agree with everything I wrote yeah. in there. And he was still, you know, uh, you know, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. But I think he still has those sympathies. But I've tried to get him on the Liberty Report, my little program. Yeah, but we haven't been able to do that because it'd be interesting if he would come clean. And just have a frank discussion about, uh, you know, where he's been and what he thinks of. And he still has respect for the gold standard. But um, I guess he's not likely to come on. Well, I'll never forget one of his great attempts to placate the Ron Paul movement was when he told you that uh, under his chairmanship, the Fed tried to mimic a gold standard, which I, I, I thought was very interesting. L last question for you. A long time ago, and I would argue a better Fed chair, did you know uh, Paul Volcker much, and did you ever have conversations with him? Yes, I liked him on a personal basis. I thought he was more intellectual and more upfront, and I think it was the Monetary, uh, Monetary Act, I think 19... 80 or something that came in, which was a big deal. It was uh, enhancing the power of the Fed. And we had a public disagreement on, uh, uh, you know, giving the Fed too much power to manipulate interest rate and buy foreign debt as collateral for our money. And he kept saying, well, you misunderstood that. So he invited me to breakfast one day. Uh, so we went over, Lou Rockwell went with me, and we remember this very well because it was just with Volcker. And it must have been in 1979 when that occurred because uh, uh, we got there early and Volker Staffer was there. His chief of staff was there. And uh, we talked and gabbed just, uh, you know, socially. And then Volker came in and Volker, you know, spotted us there. But he came right over to where we were talking. But he didn't look at me uh, because he had looked 
And immediately to his staffer and said, what's the price of gold this morning? <laughs> That's when gold had gone from 35 up to uh, 800. So he was thinking about gold. But uh, and there's yeah. been some stories that he was not super excited about 1971, you know, and, and actually spoke out about it. But but he he was not an Austrian economist for sure. But uh, it was it was a little more dignified. Matter of fact, uh, the the instant, the, the uh, Mises Institute had uh, a, a function up in uh, in Washington one time, and there was a f- member of the board there by the name of Wallach, who was very very dignified person. He would come out, and he was a good friend of Hayek's. And I remember uh, meeting the th- the two of them at one time, and uh, I was a, a very impressed about how they treated each other. They treated other other people like you know, an academician. And they talked about it, and, and yet they were on different viewpoints. And that was the time I had dinner with Hayek. So it was very, uh, it was very interesting. So uh, the the, um, the the whole the whole thing there is that uh, there there is still a lot of interest, and it's going to happen because uh, this what we have today on the in the monetary system just can't continue. So uh, yes, I've been. Ex- Exposed to a couple of them, but uh, the answer to your question is yes, I did know Volcker and <laughs> tend to like them. <laughs> well, as uh, Jim Grant says, we've gone from a gold standard to a PhD standard. So, with that, Ron, it's great to see you and thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.